police from in the morning. Welcome, B-Movie fans. It's the start of a new month, which means a whole new month of B-Movie reviews. However, this month we're going to be, pr- be doing a little extra. Each month, Phantom Dark Dave and I will be selecting a different director and watching as many films by this director as possible. Each week, we will be discussing a different film by that director, and at the end of the month, we'll each decide which five films by that selected director that we like the best. And who better to start off off with than the master of suspense himself, Alfred Hitchcock. I'm B-Movie Paul. And I'm Phantom Dark Dave. So this week we will be reviewing Alfred Hitchcock's crime drama, Rope, from 1949, starring James Stewart, John Dahl, and Farley Granger. To start things off, here's a brief summary of Rope, courtesy of IMDb. Two young men strangle their inferior classmate, hide his body in their apartment, and invite his friends and family to a dinner party as a means to challenge the perfection of their crime. Alright, so, Dave, what did you think of Rope? Well, I'm very excited that this is the first Alfred Hitchcock movie we're going to talk about, because this is, in fact, my favorite Alfred Hitchcock movie. Um, Like you said, 1948-1949 time, Alfred Hitchcock's first colorized film, and uh, I think we both agree on some of the best aspects on this movie, but uh, for me, it's all about the acting. Oh, definitely. Especially with um, John Dahl as Brandon Shaw. Was it Brandon? Yeah, Brandon Shaw. He was fantastic as, like, just this psychotic guy. Like, well, not really psychotic as in, like, going out and, like, attacking everybody, but just this killing somebody and then acting so calm about it. It was, what an underrated performance. Yeah, no kidding. And, you know, the funny thing about him, too, did you ever, he kind of looks like he could be related to, like, Jason Sudeikis, in a way, like his facial features, but his acting was that of, like, Kevin Spacey. It was pretty entertaining. Yeah, definitely interesting. Like, he'll, like, like people will come over and he'll start telling jokes and everything, and while, the, while his friend is freaking out about the fact they just killed somebody, and yeah, that was really good. It's kind of a shame you never hear him mention and his performance mentioned whenever they talk about crazy people in films or murders. Yeah, that's true. He he doesn't really make any other any list unless the movie itself is brought up. Definitely. But uh, you know, another thing that I really loved about this movie is uh, the fact that it was just ten takes. You know, ten individual shots blended as one. Yeah, that was really impressive. Like the whole thing is plays off like you said is one scene just continuously going and i thought they pulled that off perfectly if somebody told me it was all one continuous um shot and they hadn't they hadn't um, cut anything i would have thought it was i would have um completely believed that yeah and especially in, in that time you know imagine watching this in uh you know 1948 1949 they're gonna how did they do that these people memorize their lines the whole time and uh what i did find kind of funny about it was um i didn't count how each of the uh frames switched but um i did notice at least five of them was all behind john Dahl's back oh, like yeah. he would walk across the screen you know he would turn and answer the phone he would reach for the books whatever it was the camera would go behind him and then switch into the next frame. And you know at that time, you know, he's like, cut. All right, next scene. Action. But, man, it literally looks like it's the same sentence. Oh, like definitely. Like, you can't tell. Yeah, that was really clever, clever the way they did that. Like, Hitchcock in general is a, such a, was such a great director. Like, just the shots he do, like, just to build suspense. The um, If I remember correctly, he was one of the first directors to do a a view from from one of the characters to switch over from that, and that really was impressive at the time. They yeah, spent, that is really cool. I, I gotta look that up. That's neat. Yeah, they called it, like, um, turning the audience into, like, voyeurs or something like that, because it's like they're <laughs> actually looking at things. It's definitely neat. Like, you see that in films like Vertigo and um, Rear Window and things like that, but, yeah. It was... Yeah, possibly more movies we'll talk about later this month, right? Oh, definitely. <laughs> Definitely, definitely uh, high on the list there for popular movies for him. Oh yeah. But uh, what did you think of the other character, the Farley Granger character? He played um Philip. Philip, Morgan. right? Yeah. yeah. He wasn't as entertaining as as Brandon, but I still he was the guy who was freaking out. Like, I imagine I'd probably be him if I had murdered somebody. <laughs> so 
It was more believable, and they did kind of balance each other out. You really got to see how insane Brandon was because of just how freaked out Philip was. So I thought they really kind of they went really well together as the two murderers. So because you've worded that so specifically, you know what I'm going to say next, right? Because they went together so well, there's a, a, a certain tone this movie has. Did you pick up on that? Um, I believe I did. Yeah, it's kind of written all across this movie with the uh, relationship that uh, the two main characters have and the way that um, the John Dahl character even acts towards the professor. It's uh, There's something going on there that's not really mentioned vocally. It's, it's never specified, but it's very hinted that they had a certain preference for um, other gentlemen, I'd say. Well, yeah, because, you know, even in the scene, whenever the two main actors are talking and, and Brandon, you know, he's he's feeling good about the murder because he's he's all high and mighty, full of confidence. And Philip's shocked. But he asks him, he's like, how did that make you feel? And you're like, what? And then he's all like, I didn't feel anything. And he's like, well, I sure did, especially when the body was limp. And he looks at him and I'm just like, are we talking about the same thing here? <laughs> yeah. But... um whatever they were trying to say without saying it or whatever they were doing, I mean, they really made you feel that there was just something that it was beyond our understanding that there was a deep relationship there, whatever it was, that it bonded them together, maybe before the murder, but definitely throughout the murder, that was um, definitely divided whenever <clears throat> their teacher shows up. Oh, yeah. And considering this was made in 1949, when those kind of things really weren't discussed, it was Definitely an interesting approach to take, I thought. Yeah, I was going to say, we're kind of talking like it's 1948, like, oh, I, I don't want to say what it is. Yeah, but <laughs> it's like, nowadays it's like fine, but like, it's just really weird. You wouldn't expect that, a movie of that time period, but I think Alfred Hitchcock kind of enjoyed hitting on certain taboos. So I wouldn't be surprised if all that was really done on purpose. I, I really do think it was. Yeah, no, definitely, because honestly, I think it actually gives the movie just a little bit more, because you're wondering now the whole time, and the performances are so believable in this movie, and uh, I actually did some research, and the main actors were actually both gay anyway, in, in their average ordinary life, so they were able to just really put on that finesse, so to speak, in the film, and you just didn't know what was going to happen. Uh, Hollywood actors that are gay? No way. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's no Rock Hudson in this movie, but I'm just saying. <laughs> Alfred Hitchcock, he, he's a master. We're going to talk about him this month, but this movie just stands out to me with, you know, it's his first colorized film. Um, he did it in 10 shots. You know, the performances are out the window, just mind-blowing. And I just feel like this movie, it doesn't get the credit it deserves. It gets a good eight stars on IMDb. Probably could guess what it's beaten by. <laughs> Psycho. But, um. What everybody knows by Alfred Hitchcock. Exactly. I just, uh. I hope that when people start listening to this podcast or if, you know, they're watching Psycho and they're like, what else should I get? I hope they, they check out Rope. It's a really good movie. Definitely. Yeah. One of the things I really liked about this film was it's very intelligent in its dialogue. The reason why they kill the guy, which I thought was really interesting, was. They did it just to see if they can get away with it. like, And they thought that they had the right to kill this guy because they were both really smart. So they at one point talk about Nietzsche and the whole Ubermensch um, philosophy and saying that, you know, we, we're the smartest, we're the greatest, we're the, you know, supermen or whatever. And basically they had the right to use other people as they wanted, including murdering them for their own entertainment. And they talk about it as, as kind of a thought exercise when um, their teacher comes in and starts talking about philosophy. Of, you know, some people are beyond normal moral restrictions because they're superior to everyone else. And it's, it's all a, a, thought pro, a thought exercise, but these guys just take it uh, completely too far. And just how they're talking about it, especially Brandon's character, he was so good at just that psychotic... I have the right to do this. And you can see he thinks that way about almost everyone in the film. At one point, there is the guy they murdered. Um, his fiance is there, and he invites her ex-boyfriend there, and he's just messing with their relationship. And he's like, kind of like hinting that 
the guy they killed, David, is dead, but, like, not saying it. He's like, I know I can get away with this because I'm just so much smarter than everyone else. And it's so entertaining to watch, but it's it's really creepy because you know this guy just murdered somebody and he's just he's playing everybody like um like they're puppets and it's it's really it's really an interesting concept for a movie that pretty much primarily focuses around a party where people are talking yeah definitely he, he's he's really full of himself he has a lot of mind power and he definitely uses that on everybody else in the film especially philip poor philip is in love with him and it's funny that it's <laughs> he's afraid of him you can tell he you know he's it's a menacing figure to him but that's probably what he finds attractive i don't know um it, yeah he just even the way he, he talks to you know his elders and everything in this movie he, he pretty much just you know, lets them know, like you said, like, oh, we're superior, we're rich, we're, you know, we could kill, you know, we can end poverty, you know, we can, you know, like James Stewart says in the movie, because it is only a thought exercise in his mind, like, there'll be no more standing in line at the movie theater, you know, yeah. but um, yeah, that's another thing to talk about, too. How, how about James Stewart, man? He was amazing. Yeah, James Stewart, like, he's been in so many Hitchcock films, and He's got that way of talking that's very Stewart, but like, he's his performance of this was so different from anything I've seen him in before. He was much more intellectual. He was much more, I don't want to say soft spoken, but he was more like you could tell everything he was doing was well thought out, and he definitely came off as a lot more intellectual than in say um, Vertigo or Rear Window or anything like that, where he was intelligent in those too. But in this one, he was like. He definitely portrayed the teacher very well. Yeah, which is um, it's just kind of ironic you say that because I do agree with you. But he actually thought this was his worst performance. He 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 thought he was miscast for this movie, which oh. I I don't agree with. But you know, yeah, I thought he did great. And what I thought was really interesting was the the few times that Brandon starts to freak out. It's when his teacher uh, Rupert, who's played by James Stewart is kind of catching on or says something that might hint that he knows something's up. You can see in um, John Dahl's face just how it'll change all of a sudden where he's like suddenly he just saw somebody murdered in front of him. It's like he knows something's up and he even says in the, says in the beginning and throughout the film that he believes his teacher Rupert is possibly his only intellectual equal. So those two kind of like playing off each other was perfect like just um just brandon's reactions to things he would do he was freaked out and kind of annoyed that somebody could actually challenge him in that like he respected him, rupert very much but you can tell he also kind of hated him because he knew that he he was the one person he couldn't fuck with and i thought it was really good the way they kind of played off each other yeah especially you know end of the movie the last how many ever minutes that was the last few takes in that film and it was just those main three actors i mean it's just it was almost like watching a play which is great because it was based on a play but i I just going back to it i you know i feel like the the acting is just so unrecognized yeah definitely like it's like you said it's amazing that this is one of hitchcock's more well-known films because it is so well done it's um I think it might be just because it is such a limited setting film. It basically takes place in their apartment, like almost the entire film. That's it. And but it's such a shame because it's it's done so well. Like I, it's proof that you can have a movie that has a few people and very little like setting. And if it's well done, if the dialogue's good and this and the plot's good, you can make something like that work. And this is like the perfect B movie without being an actual B movie. And it's. It's very impressive. Yeah, and did you know that um, I, I tried to double watch a certain scene? I couldn't really tell myself. Maybe you did. Alfred Hitchcock supposedly made a cameo in the opening. Did you catch it? He was supposed to be walking down the sidewalk as they kind of open up where they show the sidewalk, and then it shows you know the apartment window. And, you know the, the curtains are closed. You hear the scream. Right in that few seconds that it is, he supposedly is walking down the sidewalk. I saw like three people, but I couldn't pinpoint a big guy. Yeah, I didn't. I actually didn't notice him. I actually hadn't heard of that until just now. So I'm gonna have to. Yeah, I challenge it, you man. to take another look and let me know if you noticed it. I don't know if I just, you know, it's not correct, but 
you know, he is known for making those kind of cameos, and I know certain films he does. I just, that one, I had to rewatch that part, and I just didn't catch it. If anybody who's listening to this did, please let us know. We want to know. Definitely. Yeah, one interesting thing about this was this is actually this film was actually based off a true story. There was a murder in 1924. These two college students um, from the University of Columbia, their names were Nathan Leopold and Richard Loeb, and they kidnapped and murdered a 14-year-old boy just to just to prove that they can make the perfect crime and they'd never get caught. And, well, judging on what happened, I guess they couldn't pull that off. But definitely a sad story, but, like, it was basically the same kind of thing. They were obsessed with crime. They were both extremely intelligent. Nathan Leopold guy had an IQ of 210, which is just insane. And wow. just, yeah, they, they believed that they were smarter than everyone else. They were very big followers of, uh, of um, Friedrich Nietzsche. And, yeah, it's, I thought that... I'm glad it, this wasn't a direct following of that because it would have, I don't think it would have really worked out well, but kind of just having a story based off of it I thought worked really well. Just because there's so many concepts in it that if they tried to make something too realistic, I think it would have been lost. Yeah, it would have been a different film entirely and it, would, it probably wouldn't have worked for Hitchcock. It's not really his style. But it just goes to show you, you know, you don't need James Stewart to, uh, to foil your plans. You know, it can happen anyway. So, you know how I feel about this movie. 10 out of 10. It's a 10. Yeah, I'd say if I had to rate this one, I'd probably give it... I'd give it a 9 out of 10, and there were a couple problems I had with it. They're very minor, but... One okay, of them... I will I will let you say the problems, and it may not hurt our friendship. Go ahead. <laughs> Alright, so this is just... Um, <laughs> this is because I thought it was a weird scene, but at one point, Brandon and Philip are arguing because... Phil, um, Brandon's completely calm about everything. He's making jokes, and he likes to kind of mess with people and get like get a, get reactions. You find that Philip doesn't eat chicken, and then Brandon goes, "Remember that time you choked a chicken?" And then he starts freaking <laughs> out about it. And like, I thought it was is overall a good scene because you kind of see that like one Brandon likes to mess with people, and Philip's starting to get unhinged because of everything. But just the whole he strangled a chicken. What like? That was yeah. It's not really a criticism, but that was just weird. Like, and the thing with that was that was what really chewed James Stewart's character into figuring out what they did. Which I don't know for everything to be tied to the fact that at some point this guy strangled a chicken was just a little weird for me. And I think that's really my only criticism. That's not really a criticism. It's just one of those like, wait, he did what? Yeah, before that, I just thought that Brandon kind of manipulated Philip into joining him with the murder because he obviously has um, had feelings for him, and I kind of thought that he was sort of pressured into it. So then finding out he strangled like chicken, it was just weird. Like, I didn't really like that choice. You're like, I didn't know he had it in him. Yeah, it's like, I thought he was just this meek guy who was, prob- was kind of like probably a little insecure about his like feelings for men. And then, like, he meets this guy who's, you know, well-spoken, really smart. And then like, that's when he does this thing he never thought he'd do. But, like, just this strangling a chicken thing was just a bit much for me. Maybe it was a metaphor. Ah, there we go. I mean, that's just more open dialogue there. Yeah. And he's like, D- what do you know about that? And he's like, well, I saw you. And he's like, you did. <laughs> oh, I saw you strangle I saw you choking that chicken. And yeah, and then James Stewart's like, he did what? <laughs> oh, he must be a murderer now. <laughs> yeah, it's 1948, you can't do that. This whole, this whole movie what? is just an allegory for homosexuality. Like, cause back then it was like illegal to be gay, so it's like, that was the big act that they were trying to cover up. And like, so this whole thing is just right. Ryan Hitchcock's allegory. That's, that's the rumor that I'm going to spread all over the internet now. There you go. You know, another thing I really liked about the movie, too, is, and it's, I think it's the thing I like about um, a lot of classic movies, is everybody's so well-dressed. Like, you know, it's an apartment dinner party, yeah, but man, there was some good suits in there. I mean, everybody was just top-notch looking and very suave. I mean, we could have had a few different James Bonds in there, I'm just saying. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's kind of cool seeing things like that, like, just back when like people used to dress up for like everything and you know i'm kind of glad because it's such a pain in the ass to do but looked cool back in that 
time period. And you can definitely tell something doesn't take place now because no one does that. Like, well, like, hurry up, Paul, get on your suit. Why? We're going to get milk. Like, this sucks. <laughs> we have to go to the market now. That's right. Oh, good times. Well, I'm excited we got to do it. I think this movie is freaking awesome. If you haven't seen it, watch it. I'm not saying it's the best thing, but I'm saying it's my favorite Hitchcock. We'll find out if this, this is definitely one of my favorite Hitchcock films. We'll see how far it ranks at the end of the month, but next week we will re- be reviewing another Hitchcock film. Um, not sure which one we should pick for that one, so this will be a surprise for everybody next time. All right, this is B Movie Paul, Phantom Dark Dave, and we will be back with another movie next week. <laughs> I don't want to make this cool. I'm seeing it all the way out.